We're on the on the recording. Um, hopefully, um, you can join us next time, next class. We were just talking about what we did last time, and last time we talked about how regression was a conditional expectation function function modeling machine. So in the social sciences, we don't care always or only about m what we called marginal quantities. And if you don't remember what that word means, definitely ask. But we talked about marginal quantities. But we also introduced this notion of a conditional quantity. This was related to the idea of a conditional probability function or a conditional um, probability mass or density function. But it also brought into, uh, into, into the discussion a few new ideas as well. And the idea was we wanted to learn about averages but within some subgroup. And we talked about how there's a magical recipe for estimating those averages using the law of total expectation and other probabilistic ideas. But in some situations, you don't have a discrete conditioning set. And the whole question was, how do you condition on a variable that's continuous? So we talked about how linear regression allows us to condition on one or more variables that, are all, that could be continuous that allow for a nice generalization of what we talked about earlier regarding conditional expectation functions. So we basically posit that the expected value of some outcome, which we usually call y, um, as, a, as a function of x is equal to this linear kind of function, this linear sort of, um, this linear relationship that we see here. So the basic idea is we have some intercept term and then we have some weights on all the cov covariates. And we're basically saying the expected value of the outcome for a particular value of x is equal to some baseline, that's what we call beta zero, plus some weight times beta one, about times x one, plus some weight times x two, plus some weight x times, you know, times x three. We had this more succinct linear algebra-like notation, which we're going to talk more about today, since linear algebra is a, a vehicle, it's a tool, it's a, a language for characterizing data and also operations on data. So we're going to talk about the linear algebra today. But we also talked about this last time. So we talked about how it was a conditional expectation function that we're trying to estimate. We assume a linear structure on that. And then there's another way of looking at this too, where we have this epsilon. And this epsilon is essentially a mean zero random noise term. So these two, two ways of representing regression are equivalent. Either is a conditional expectation function or is an estimate, estimation of this equation where all these epsilons are like the things that you can't really model, the things that you don't observe, the errors in your model, basically. All the deviations from this baseline, um, this baseline mean, if you will. Any questions about that? So that's what we've done. If it doesn't make sense yet, then come and talk to us or raise a question now. Because if there's anything that looks askance, we should talk about it. So for example, one thing that might look askance is why is this beta bold, but this beta is not bold? And these betas aren't bold either. Well, one reason for that, you might have been asking it, and I, I bet some of you were, is that this beta here is actually going to be a stack of coefficients. So it's going to represent a vector, not just uh, what's called a scalar. So it gets a little bit confusing, and those of you who are on the Zoom watching, it's going to cause a bit of confusion. But when it comes to random variables, capitalized means the random variable, lowercase means a specific realization. We talked about that. That's now second nature to you. But the other thing that we're talking about now is vectors and matrices and uh, scalars. And we're going to have a similar overlapping but also distinct conventions for doing that too. So we're going to talk about it, and Andres will do a great job with the, um, the further extensions into these topics. So we've talked about this already, and we've talked about this. Andres? Do you think you could um, elaborate a little bit on what we mean when we say assuming like linearity? It's always going to be a bit hard to me. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. And I'm, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts too, and anyone in the room too. But the question is, what do we mean by linearity? So, linearity. Well, actually, this this actually goes well to something we'll talk about. This is we're like presaging it, and we didn't even collaborate on this. But there's a notion in in linear algebra, also in just algebra, about a linear equation. In the context of linear equation modeling, we say that this y equals ax plus b. That was something that we talked a little bit about in the um, uh, in you know R functions. We have that AB line function, and if you literally just want to plot a line in R, you can use um, a, a formula like this, where y equals ax plus b, where a and b are what we would call you know just uh, terms in this 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 you know system of this this equation. 
So that's what we have in the context of a linear equation. We have, you know, ax, we have a, we have x, we have, we have y, we have all these different things. And um, what we're doing here in the context of linear regression, you can think about it as generalizing this notion of a line into a higher dimensional sort of space. So we're no longer just saying y equals ax plus b, but now we're going to say um, we have a whole number of equations, we have a whole sort of series of variables, and we can write them like this, where we have this matrix of, of um, weights, and then we have this vector of x's, and then we have this, um, this, this they, they equal another vector. So that's what we have here, and the link to regression is the following. So in regression, we might still want to basically fit a line to our data. So we have some outcome, and that outcome is we have some outcome data that looks sort of like this. And what we're basically going to try to do is find a way to fit a best fit line to that data, whereas before we just had, um, you know, we had x and we had y, and this line was just a deterministic function of, you know, ax plus b. We had this literal line here in the context of algebra. That's what we did in algebra when we had a, we had a line, and we just uh, parameterized it by an a and a b, and ax plus b just gave us a line. But now we no longer have a situation like this. Now we have a bunch of data points. We don't have the line. We just have the data points. But we still want to fit a line there. In what what um, what that basically means is we want to figure out a way to um, still have a formula that looks sort of like this, where we have an a and we have an x, and we have a b. But now we're going to basically say let's um, in let's take all of the input variables for all these data points. So every data point here has a little vector of data associated with it. You know, it might have age, it might have, you know, ethnicity, it might have um, uh, treaty status, it might have all these, uh, each point here, each outcome um, has all of these things associated with it. And what we're going to try to do is to figure out a way to weight all of these input variables like age, race, uh, treaty status, um, to, to generate a prediction for these outcomes that is as good as it can be, that's best fit in some sense. So what we're going to do in regression, using the ideas that we're talking about today, is we're going to basically say we have this matrix of all the data that we've stuffed, we, we've stuffed all the data into a matrix. We haven't really introduced the notion of a matrix yet, but we've stuffed all the data into some kind of uh, object, which we call X, capital X, and we basically are going to weight all of the different elements in that array by the coefficients and we're going to in that manner kind of fit a best fit line to the data weighting all of the input variables um, so as to be, uh, generate the best outcome the best prediction of the outcome that's linear in these input variables where linear means we're taking all the inputs and we're weighting them by some scalar and we're adding the sum of all those things up and then we have a baseline intercept term, which we also include. So that's one way of saying it. Maybe I presage that a little bit too, too much, but um, the basic idea is we have a set of inputs, and we want to use those inputs to generate a prediction. And those inputs are all being weighted together in this sort of linear way, where weighting them, weighting them together basically means some of these variables are going to receive a higher weight, and some of them are going to receive a lower weight, so as to be, and we're going to choose all those things so as to be, best predict the outcome based on the least squares criteria. In other words, um, it could be if we had a very, if we had, if we were trying to predict whether a country enters a treaty, one of the thing with another country, one of the things that might really matter is whether those two countries speak the same language. If those two countries speak the same language, we would pretend, we could include that um, that variable in the data as one of the x's. And we, when the two countries speak the same language, like in terms of their populations, they, if they're more likely to, to have a treaty together, then that coefficient would be positive. But if, if um, one of the variables was two countries are engaged in resource competition for, let's say, oil, then the coefficient on that variable would be negative. So positive coefficients and negative coefficients have a different interpretation as to how they affect the, um, the overall expectation, the conditional expectation. So that's one way of saying it. What are, you, are there thoughts? Are there questions? Follow-ups. So linearity basically means we have all of the data. So if we have, let's just take a univariate regression. We have x, we have a y, and the data aren't totally linear. The data are all they're full of 
what I would call noise. There, there, it's not a totally linear relationship between these two things. You know, we might even have one value of x that has multiple values of y. So it can't be per perfectly linear. So this is like a, we could we could estimate this conditional expectation by having this really complex complex jig-jag pattern, but that complex jig-jag pattern is not going to be parsimonious. It's not going to be something that I'll be able to explain easily to others, and I'm not going to be able to clearly say how one variable affects another in some associational way. So by linearity, we basically say, I'm assuming away the presence of these jig-jags, and when I plot the conditional expectation of x given y, I'm basically going to assume away the existence of these jig-jags, I'm going to assume the presence of this line. So in other words, you, one way to think about this, and I know I'm kind of jumping a little bit, but one way to think about this is at every value of x, you have a distribution of y. So for example, at this value of x, you have these four values of y, one, two, three, four. And you can think about that in terms of a little mini density plotted like this um, over that particular position of x. So you have a little, you can think about a regression as essentially taking these data points and applying like a, a three-dimensional kind of volume over all these data points where that volume is proportional to the density. And what we are trying to estimate is the expectation um, across all the different r values of x, the conditional mean of all of these different distributions that we're kind of s using as we slice along the data. That would be another way of thinking. Yeah, question. Uh, well, why a line and not a curve? Yeah, good question. So for those on the Zoom, the question is why a line and not a curve? And the answer is we can, so there are two levels to the answer. The first answer is a line is easier to explain in that a single, in, uh, in baseline linear regression, a single coefficient captures how one variable relates to the outcome. So this variable xi1, that's basically the first covariant. This single parameter, beta1, totally controls how um, x1 influences my predicted outcome. In other words, uh, I don't have to think about anything else besides beta1 when thinking about the, um, the way in which x1 affects the outcome. And we'll talk a little bit more about the interpretation of these coefficients. I haven't really given you a quote unquote rigorous interpretation yet, but the basic idea is when we have a perfectly linear model, interpretability, explainability is much improved. In other words, in my social science theory, I might be interested in predicting the level of um, representation for, um, for some group on the basis of the size of that group. I don't want some complicated function you know, relating the size to that, to that representation. I want just a single parameter that is used in generating the prediction because if, I, if I'm testing, uh, if I have a single parameter, then I can do what we're going to call a hypothesis test to evaluate my theory through this single hypothesis test for the single coefficient, the single parameter. So as soon as I have a nonlinear model, I might have a more complex relationship between the input and the output, and it would therefore be more difficult to summarize the relationship. So I think one answer is parsimony. Another answer is um, our data are full of measurement error, and these lines often are very robust to what we call overfitting. So the idea is if I draw a more complex jig-jaggy pattern, I might just be fitting on noise in the data and not truly learning about a, a true underlying systematic relationship. So that would be another kind of answer. So it's really kind of a deep question. There are multiple layers to the onion. Um, another, um, another answer would even be, well, you can take a linear regression and make it nonlinear. And later on in the semester, we're going to talk a little bit about how you can actually take linear regression and add nonlinearities to it by including quadratic and other sorts of polynomial or other sorts of nonlinear terms in the regression. In other words, you can always take something that's nonlinear non and sort of make it linear, so to speak, by adding in those um, nonlinear transformations of the x's as new covariates, so as to further enrich the expressive capacity of your model. That's beyond the scope of today's discussion, although we might be able to play around with it in the second half. Good question. Other questions, is there anything that people are not feeling, you know, 150% good about? Question. 
Yeah, good question. So for those of you who are unfortunately unable to be with us today, question is, um, basically, I know when I think of a uh, when I think of a line, I think of an x, and I think of a y, and there's one x, and there's one y, and there's just a straight line through it. How do I think about that in the context of linear regression, or what we would what we'll start to call multivariate linear regression, where we have multiple inputs and um, and, and you know not just one predictive variable, not just one x. But many x's. So um, the answer there is well. So we could just always limit ourselves to a univariate regression where we just have one predictor variable, and we basically say the conditional expectation of the outcome on the basis of all the covariates is just equal to some baseline beta zero plus beta one times x one, and then just limit ourselves stopping at that. But we want to have a more complex model, so. One example of that from the IR literature, if I can think of it on the spot, one example would be, um, one example would be, let's think of this um, IR. So outcomes would be, let's say, war. So if war is my outcome, I might be interested in um, like resource competition or something. So resource, uh, the level of resources, um, the level of resources might be on the x-axis and the level of war might be on the y-axis and based on my theory I might have a specific prediction I don't know like this or like this or whatever it would be let's just say it's downward a downward sloping line and I have all my data but I might see that um, that there are patterns of that, that, that my data that my model doesn't perfectly fit my data because in this case the level of resources might interact with the level of democracy to generate the probability of war or the expected value of war. So in that case, I might um, have a situation where not just one thing a, a kind of affects the outcome in some associational way, but multiple things affect the outcome, and I'm going to add them into my model in this linear fashion, where I just I add in you know beta one x one plus beta two x two, where this beta two x two can incorporate the that measure of democracy together with this measure of the level of resource resources and then my prediction for the outcome or for the expected outcome is now a function of both of those two things not just one of those two things so it's a way of enriching and enhancing the expressive capability of my model and another thing that this can do is it controls for um, sources of variability in the outcome that aren't associated with your kind of treatment of interest or your um, theoretical theoretical variable of interest. Um, so as people might say the level of resources matters but also the level of democracy matters and our way of incorporating that idea into our model is to include the level of resources together with the level of democracy both in our linear regression model which is modeling the um, the expected value of war given those two things and then we could add more and we could add more and we could add more and we could add more. So when you look at regressions in the social science literature, you'll often see regressions side by side. The first regression will be univariate, where people report the um, just the baseline simplest regression you could possibly do, where you have your main variable of interest and you're trying to predict the outcome. But then you'll often see another uh, regression right next to it, where they've added in a bunch of what we call control variables and um, we're basically saying when we also account for other things like the level of democracy the coefficient of interest um, maintains its sign of significance like that's the kind of argument that we'll make we haven't really talked about the notion of significance yet we haven't really talked about the notion of um, you know hypothesis testing yet but that's the general idea does that answer your question okay good thank you yeah Yeah, good question. So for, for, the, for those of you on the Zoom, the question is, how does this compare to regression discontinuity? Or talk a little bit about that. So regression discontinuity is, it's, it has the word regression, and there are some similarities to what we're doing here, but it's a different method for a particular problem involving observational data inference, where we're trying to make causal claims about something on the basis of 
data that wasn't explicitly randomized. So it's a more specific tool. Um, regression, as we're talking about here, is a very general tool for modeling conditional expectations. That's what regression is. Whereas regression discontinuity designs, um, which are a subset of causal inference designs, those, um, those designs do something a little bit different with a different goal. They're not you know, attempting to make a general model for these expected uh, these expectations. Instead, they're trying to do something a little bit different. Stephen talks about that in his course on causal inference. And we can talk about that maybe in a problem set as it relates to what we're doing here. Since in the regression discontinuity context, there is often um, a lot of emphasis placed on modeling conditional expectations, but it's, it's a more specialized sort of topic. So um, maybe I'll leave it at that, but we can definitely maybe think about adding a question on that in the problem sets. Question. Yeah, good. So I'll try. And others, if you have better, you know, better ones, jump in too. So regression, you know, also known as OLS, so ordinary least squares. You know, these terms are sort of synonymous. They're they're just names for the same thing. But what matters is not the name, but the concept. And the concept is, you know, one way of expressing the concept is we're trying to model the conditional expectation of some outcome, given some covariates. And we do so in a linear fashion, where that basically means we're going to take all of the input variables in that coefficient vector, and we're going to weight them, and we're going to add up those weighted sum, that weighted sum, and we're going to add a baseline as well. That's called the intercept. And that whole big thing together will get, generate the predicted, um, that will generate the expected value of y given x. And this is one way to explain what regression is doing. Andres will have, I'm sure, different interpretations, which is good so that you get a different interpretation or a different way of explaining it. But, does, yeah, question. Is this, so when we're reading papers and they're saying, this means this is a good predictor of this, is that what regression is? Yeah, that's, it's, it's related to that, yeah. So this notion of what's a good predictor versus what's a bad predictor, it's, there are, there's, a, there's sort of a lot to say about that. But the basic idea is some variables are going to be more correlated with the outcome than others. So when I, you know, you can think about this, like imagine, a, imagine I had a set of three variables, like B1, B2, and B3. And maybe this is, and I'm trying to predict war. One of these might be, I don't really know. You, you know, we can talk to an IR person, they would tell us. So we have these three variables. We've talked to an IR person and they've told us what they are. We now know. And um, so we could think about this in terms of like a for loop. Well, let's write a for loop where I iterate over V1, V2, and V3 and plot the kind of the, the histogram of V1 against war. And maybe V1 against war is going to be like this, where as I change V1, the expected level of war doesn't change. That's telling me when I change V1, it doesn't really change the, the value of war. So this wouldn't be a great predictor in that sense. If I drew a, a line like this, it could be that this coefficient isn't statistically different than zero in ways that we'll talk about. But if I had another variable, for example, I'm iterating through my for loop, now all of a sudden I'm at V3, and V3, there's a relationship that looks like this, where is, is I increase the value of B3, the value of war changes a lot too. And if I thought, if I think again to that kind of volumetric, um, what's, like I'm trying to think of an analogy. If I, if I think of those, those little bell curves that are sort of living on top of this scatter plot, these bell curves are really tight and the, the accuracy of this prediction is really good. Um, this would be a, like a good predictor or something that's highly predictive of war. It gets a little bit complicated when we have multiple variables all at once because it sometimes is the case that one variable on its own doesn't really matter, but if we account for the level of some other variable, all of a sudden it makes a difference. So it gets a little bit complicated, but in general, a word of caution, if the univariate plot doesn't look, if, you, if there's no, you know, this is broad generalization and, and you know, we can criticize it, but in, in, in many circumstances, if the univariate regression isn't significant, or if you don't see at least some kind of compelling relationship in this sort of univariate plot where you have an X and you have a Y, um, when you add in additional complexity with additional covariates, um, 
that's good too, but you'll often need the baseline. In other words, it's, you need to have the simple things so as to be able to move on to the complex thing. That's often what you'll see in these papers. Good question. Other questions, other follow-ups? Yeah, I want this definitely, since regression is so important, I definitely want us to do the hands-on before we get into the theory of it, since I just don't want to lose anyone along the way. Um, so we've talked about all of these things. I don't see any more questions, but definitely do stop. Because like I said, if there's something that doesn't make sense, we need to stop. Um, now I'm just gonna, um, let's, uh, let's go to the practical essentials because I just want it to be practical. And then we can go back to what I just skipped, which is a little bit more theoretical, which talks more about estimation. So we've, we've kind of outlined a modeling strategy, but we haven't really gave, given you the algorithm or the recipe or the instruction book for performing that kind of theoretically. But we are going to give you a recipe book just practically, you know, in terms of fitting the model. On this slide, I have very concrete details, which we'll also do in the tutorial, about just how you fit the model. So when you fit the model, I'm going to talk about it just because it's so important that we get this down, all of us together. We have some, some we have a data frame, my underscore DF. A data frame is slightly different than a data matrix. Um, the, but they're related. And we haven't really talked about what a matrix is, and we'll talk about that next. But a data frame is basically um, uh, an object for storing data in R. It's different from a matrix in that a matrix can only have one kind of data in it. It either all has to be character or all has to be numeric. Whereas a data frame, you can mix and match. You can have you know, some character variables, some numeric variables, some uh, factor variables. You, have, you can mix and match with different data types. That's a data frame. So you're basically saying LM, that stands for linear model, Y tilde X1 plus X2 comma data equals my DF. So I'm basically saying, give to this function two things. LM is the function, and I'm giving it two things. The first thing is this formula, Y tilde X1 plus X2. That's the first thing. And the second thing I'm giving it is data equals my DF. That's the second thing. The first thing is basically a formula which tells our find the y variable in my underscore df and have that be a linear function of x1 and x2 and then fit a OLS using that structure. That's what this is saying. I could have added a zero in this formula, like zero plus x1 plus x2. If I add a zero, what we're basically doing there is we're removing that intercept term, that baseline that we used in our model. But that's not super important. You can also use alternative approaches towards fitting these models. For example, LM, my, you know, DF, you know, dollar sign Y. Basically, you can make this thing more explicit, but it's better to keep it simple. So then to, there are a lot of things you can do with this my underscore LM object. This my underscore LM object basically does a lot of the things that we might want to do for us. So for example, it obtains predicted values from this regression. So my underscore LM, um, new data equals my DF. Basically, we're going to take this linear model, and then we're going to take this potentially new data, and we're going to generate predictions. This might be really important since in your papers, for example, the ones that you're writing for the scope and methods class, you might want a plot where on the x-axis you have um, some value of, you, you know, let's say age, and then on the y-axis you have the predicted outcome based on your regression model. When you're making plots like that, you would potentially be wanting to use um, this predict function. So this is just another function which takes in as, in as an input this my you know, LM object, that's a linear regression object, and it spits out the prediction. We'll talk about that again later on too. Um, new data, you know, it's, it's optional if it's not. Here's just a few more details for you about what happens if you don't have, you know, if you don't include new data here, what happens. And you, there are other functions as well that I've listed out here since I want everyone to definitely get all these things when it comes to regression. We can extract the coefficients from this my LM, my LM object. So remember, we have that, lin that conditional expectation function and we've assumed that it was linear, meaning it had a certain structure to it. And I sometimes might want to get, you know, what are all my coefficients? And you can use the coef my LM to basically get all the coefficients. In other words, the coefficients might be too, you know, it'll just be, for, for example, in this case, when I would run that my coef, my coef function, it would just give me three num it would give me four numbers, 
one number for the intercept. One number for the intercept, so it would just be, you know, like three, two, seven, six, seven, or whatever it would be. And um, each variable would have a coefficient associated with it. So this would be a named vector. And it's named because you'll get all the coefficients and there'll be a little name for each number. And that's called a named vector. You can also perform what we're going to call later on in the course hypothesis tests by going coef summary my lm. So basically you're taking this um, linear regression object and then you're summarizing it and then you're take, getting the coefficients and this will give you not only the point, what we're going to call point estimate, but also the uncertainty estimates too. Since statistical inference, one of the themes on that part of the course is going to be this really amazing, beautiful idea that not only can you estimate something, but also there's a way of estimating our uncertainty around that something. And this is called statistical inference, and this is going to be important in kind of the 2.5 part of, of the course. So that's just, these are practical essentials that we'll turn to in the next, yeah, question. What does LM stand for? Yeah, LM, it just stands, I think, for linear model. So you'll, you'll in step two, you're going to use a function called GLM, and GLM just stands for generalized linear model, where generalized basically means our outcomes can, can be binary, our outcomes can be um, categorical, we'll, we'll allow for a whole variety of flavors of outcomes. Good question. Other questions? Yeah. So, uh, what does the prediction function do? Yeah, good question. So, the predict function, um, yeah, so I'll just do it on the board maybe. So, for the predict function, um, we have the predict function, so we have our outcome, our real outcome. This is the real outcome. And then we have you know, V1, V2, V3. We have all the different values of that, like 6, 2, 1, negative 5, 7, 3. Um, so what, so that this is regression. We're basically trying to find a way to weight V1, V2, V3. The weights could be negative. We're going to find a way to kind of uh, linearly combine these three variables to generate the best prediction of the outcome. We know what the true outcome is. We're generating a prediction of it. So we're going to generate a prediction, a y hat, where we're basically going to take six, um, you know, six times, you know, the coefficient times six. So like beta one times six plus beta two times two plus beta three times three plus that intercept beta zero. And this would be the predicted value of this first row where we're going to estimate these coefficients so as to minimize the sum of the squared residuals in my data. Does that make sense? In other words, we're getting the predicted value from this linear regression where that just means take these input variables, add them up with all the weights, and that generates a prediction. Other questions, other comments? All right. So um, let's think about the time. It's 1.41. Okay, let's do a vote. Let's do a vote. We could talk next about linear regression, or we could take a break, or we could talk about um, three different representations for that formula that gives you the beta coefficients. Any takers? <laughs> well, well, well. Any thoughts? What do people want to do? I brought some chocolate. I think I have it. If people want, we can have some chocolate during the break, but maybe we'll give the chocolate. But because there's chocolate, we'll have to push ourselves a little harder today. So <laughs> <laughs> let's do um, let's do let's do this. I think this is a little bit more similar to what we've been doing. Let's talk about the the recipes for those formulas a little bit later. So this is just linear algebra. For regression, I'm not going to dwell too much on this. Is perhaps this was covered a little bit in math camp, but the basic idea is linear regression is going to involve a little bit of what people call linear algebra, and that just basically means we're going to take data and structure that data, and then add together some functions for combining those you know objects together, and we're going to call that a field, and that field will be called linear algebra. So the, the building blocks of the field are things like 
vectors. We've already talked about what that what those are, but those are you know, one-dimensional arrays of numbers. So a vector, you can think of that as just as taking a1, a2, a, you know, all the way up to an and stacking that together. Here's the typo. This should, the dimensions the dimensions of this vector we can denote in a few different ways. We can say dim a equals in this case it should be this should be an n, or we could say um, a in r this should again be n. Basically, all, whenever you see this in notation, you're basically saying this a, this object a, which I haven't really defined yet, it lives in this um, d, this this n or d-dimensional space where basically we have n real numbers that together form a. So that's just the notation that you'll see. You'll either you know have people writing out the dimensions of a, or you'll basically have people saying a lives in this space defined by d real dimensional numbers. So this r stands for a real dimensional number. Then to the power of d stands for you have d different s, you know, d, d different dimensions to it. And this this symbol here, this kind of sideways e or this weird looking e, that stands for the in notation in set theory, or think of it as living in. So this is you can interpret this as saying a lives in a d dimensional space over the real numbers. That's just, and it's not super important that you get that. That's not essential. That's just kind of like background knowledge. And so you have vectors, and you probably talked about this already about matrices, where you can represent a, a, a you know, you can have a one-dimensional object called the, a vector, or you can have multiple multiple dimensions too. So an example of an important kind of matrix that we'll talk about is the data matrix, which we use in the context of regression, where each row represents a like a, a unit, and each column represents a variable. So that could be v1, that could be v2, and so on and so forth. So you have rows and you have columns. So here, every unit has a you know entry for variable one, an entry for variable two, an entry for variable three. That's the matrix. You know, I'm sure we talked about that maybe in the math camp or in other areas as well. And the cool thing about linear algebra is you can go further and further, and we don't we won't talk about as much in this class, but in the machine learning class we actually do talk about multidimensional arrays or tensors, which are which are arrays that are arranged across regular grids with a variable number of axes. So the basic idea is a scalar is a particular kind of tensor with zero dimensions, and a vector is a particular kind of tensor with one dimension, and a matrix has two dimensions, and a and uh, this 3D array has 3D dimensions. So you can basically think of kind of taking uh, a matrix. If you have one matrix here, you could stack it together with another matrix here, another matrix here, another matrix here, and you can use um, you can use stacks of matrices to represent, for example, time series data. So that's something that we'll talk about in the machine learning course. I'll bring it up here just to basically say that matrices and vectors help us organize data calculations. So that's what we have there, and we use that especially when we talk about matrix multiplication, since when we're generating this predicted value of the outcome, this y, um, we, we can write that we can write linear regression um, not just for one unit, but for all of our units together in this sort of matrix form. So remember when I first introduced linear regression, we talked about like y i equals beta 0 plus beta 1 times x i 1 and you know, plus epsilon plus epsilon i. Like that's one of the representations of regression that we've talked about and it was just with one i though. In some situations you might want to represent what happens with all of your, uh, your observations. So one way of doing that and we'll talk more about this as we go. But the basic idea is we can use matrix uh, multiplication to sort of say how my outcome here, we're going to assume that it's a linear function of x. But now I've basically taken all of my data and I've stacked them all together. And now this linear function here for one observation can be written in a similar sort of way for now all of my observations where I've stacked all of the data for all the units. So I've taken all these x's, and I've stacked all the x's, and I've stacked all the y's, and, um, and I'm basically saying I have my outcome, and I have all my data, and there's, there's sort of a linear relationship between my outcome and, and all my data, and we're using matrix multiplication 
to, to, to do that. So I'm gonna, I, I'll talk, we're gonna talk more about this. Uh, this is more of just an introduction. But the basic idea behind matrix multiplication is you're going to take this first row of the data. Um, this first row here, well, first of all, whenever we're doing, whenever we're doing linear algebra, one of the first steps that we should do is really look at the dimensions of the problem. So here we have one by one. So that basically means this, this y object has n rows and it has one column. And here we have n by d. Does someone want to tell me what does n by d mean? Yeah, exactly. I heard it. It's n rows and d columns. Whereas d by um, d by one, I mean, is you know we're basically assuming here that beta is arranged in a particular way, where it has d rows and one column, and this epsilon has you know n row n rows and one column. So whenever you're doing linear algebra, it's important that we think a little bit about um, the dimensionality of the problem. Linear algebra, it's going to come up here and there, so we're going to introduce it sort of intermittently. You can take whole courses in linear algebra, and this isn't a linear algebra course, so I, we're more giving an introduction to things that you can review on your own. But um, the basic idea is that you can write down in a very succinct way the, the predicted outcomes for everybody in your whole sample using linear algebra tools together with this idea of matrix multiplication. Here's a formula for matri for the matrix multiplication of a t matrix A times B. Base the basic idea is we're going to take um, we're going to take the rows of one matrix. Um, we're going to take the rows of one matrix on the left hand side, and we're going to um, kind of take this row, this matrix, and this column of this matrix, and we're going to compute a kind of if you will, similarity score, or we're going to multiply these two things together, we're going to add them up. And then we're going to do the same thing with all the other rows and columns too. But let's not think about the multidimensional case, let's just think about this case which we have now. This thing on the left hand side is n by d dimensions, this thing on the right hand side is d by 1 dimensions, so it has one, um, one column and it has, uh, no sorry, this should be, this should look like this. Um, it has D rows and it has one column. So basically each entry here is a different coefficient and we're basically going to take this row, this row here, so this is like the first unit's data basically. And remember we have like V1, V2, all the way up to VD. We're going to take all of these guys here and we're going to take these guys here and we're going to multiply them together and we're going to add them up. So this is what matrix multiplication is doing if you look at that formula, but it's better to just think about it visually in my personal view. So you're taking this row and you're taking this column and you're basically imagine taking this row and then twisting it and then multiplying it by this this take this column, twist it, multiply it by this row and then add everything up and that gives you the new entry in our new um, n by one dimensional uh, array. So like this entry here is going to be generated by taking this row, multiplying it by this column, adding everything up to generate this. This is important because that's how we're going to get our prediction from linear regression. We're going to do that sort of multiplication where we're taking this row, this column, multiplying you know, the first entry here, first entry here, second entry here, second entry here, third entry here, you know, third entry here. And then we're going to add them all up and then that's going to be um, basically a simple way of representing, a it's going to be hopefully a simple way of representing a simple thing, but still it's going to be more, um, it's going to allow us to represent all of the data at once as opposed to representing all of our data separately. Before we were representing all of our data separately, but now we're representing all of our data in one big object. And I've given you a formula for a prediction for all of my observations, not just one of my observations. But the beautiful thing about linear algebra, because linear algebra is such a succinct um, kind of formal system, we can represent the data for everybody with the almost exact same number of letters and symbols than I had in the original case. This original formula, this was how I represented the data for just one observation. But now the representation for all of my data is almost exactly the same. There are just a few notational differences. So this is the power of linear algebra. 
you know, it lets you represent your whole data set with the same, if not even fewer numbers of symbols and letters than you had when you were talking about one observation. So this is the power of linear algebra and why people really like it when they're talking about regression in ways that we'll continue to explore through the course. But um, this basic idea behind matrix multiplication, again, it's just you take this, take the first row, take the um, first row, first column, multiply them element-wise, add them up, um, and then you do the same. For, if there were other columns, you do the same thing, and that would determine the position in this new matrix. But here, we're basically just taking every variable, every, you know, we're taking this covariate profile here, we're doing the exact same thing we, we did up there, but we're just writing it in a slightly different way. So hopefully that's not too much for right now. I, I, there might be questions. This is more of an introduction than anything, but are there questions? Okay. Yes. So that's what I wanted to say about linear algebra by way of introduction. So th that's not really getting too deep into the weeds yet, but I wanted to introduce it to us and we'll use that a little bit in the next part of the class. Um, so why don't we take a four minute break, we'll come back together two minutes before two, and then we'll talk more about regression and we'll go from there. <laughs> so if you're in chocolates, so just, they're in this bag if you want. Hopefully they're not too melted. They're from Venezuela, I guess. If people want to pass them around. You know. Yes, so Another, another thought, um, we have all these job applicants who will soon be coming to campus to give interviews. I would definitely encourage you to go to the job talks, at least one per subfield, so that you can learn a little bit about these different subfields, how they work at the job market level. Uh, thank you. And also so that um, you can just sort of see what, what you'll hopefully be getting to in terms of when you're on the market. Since these are all successful candidates in the sense that they've gotten interviews, and for these positions and we'll be bringing them in and it's important to learn from them what they did well maybe what they didn't do as well and what you can do to improve for your own your own purposes um andres i should say is on the method search committee so any questions any comments any thoughts should be directed towards andres or towards us too but andres can be an inter intermediary as well and we can learn you know learn about some of your feelings through that process and we also do for all candidates Are still like trying to figure out their, like, their shows. It should be coming next week sometime, if, or the week after yeah, that. Yeah, it should be very soon. Yeah.
So it's just that it's that you see all you see to all the those two big job sites is that you see all the kids. Yeah. So if you have a fast job, you see all these students who are going to the job market. Or no, 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 no. We're trying to hire. As a department, we're trying to hire people, and they come at like with the coming reviews happens with applications and comes out in like before usually. Oh yeah, please. I got them in uh, yeah, Stonewall, Texas. Yeah, just outside Fredericksburg. So, took a little trip. Yeah. Oh yeah, I heard about that. It's like, oh, very cool. Okay. Wow. Well, if, the, if it's during class, we'll have to take off so we can see it. Very cool. All right, let's 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 come back together. Let's come back together. We have limited time. We only have 20 more minutes before we're ending. 20 more minutes before we're ending. So for those of you who are on the Zoom, we're starting up again. Um, so we're going to do just very practical things in R with the LM function. And we're going to use the the functions, we're going to use the tools that you're going to use all the time in your modeling, in your research, in your dissertations, and beyond. Um, so even if you go on to work in, let's say, a data science job, you're going to likely be doing regression since, well, we can talk about why. But we have that data set that we talked about last time, this India PS data. I intentionally wanted it to be a data set saved as a CSV, so you get practice loading in data into R, which I think it's kind of challenging. I think the first time you see it, it's not easy. But now you have a little practice, and now you're going to get even more practice. So this script is a little bit new from last time. I added a few things. And let's just very succinctly like work through this very practically. And we're going to use all the functions we talked about. We're going to do a few more, and we're going to talk about it. So what I've basically done here, well, can someone interpret to me what I have done? I have this. LM enrolled until they treat data equals my DF. Like insofar as you know what those things do or don't represent, can you tell me what's happening here? What is the outcome? I should ask this more concretely. What is the outcome in this particular regression model? Yes, and why do you say that? Because it's the first thing. Exactly. When you have this tilde, you're basically specifying a formula where you have a left-hand side and you have a right-hand side. And the left-hand side thing is your outcome, and your right-hand side thing is your predictor variable or variables. So treat is the predictor. So I've run the model. That basically means I fit, via that ordinary least squares principle, a, a linear model. And that linear model is linear, meaning it has coefficients. So I can use the coef function that I applied to that LM object to then generate to then generate the um, coefficients. So I can ask myself, what are, what's the class of my LM? The class of my L of my LM is an LM object, whereas the class of my coefs is it's a numeric vector. So you know that's just giving you more experience with that. So this is literally how you get the coefficients. Those are the coefficients. In other words. Um, in other words, what we've basically done is we basically said the expected value of um, enrolled, enrolled, I guess, yeah, enrolled, given treat, treat um, equals 0 0.29 plus 0 0.46 times treat. This is the conditional expectation function that we have fit to the data, and that is what we've done. This is from an experiment. 
You can use experiments and you can use regression together. Regression is a very flexible tool, which we've already discussed is for modeling conditional expectation functions. So this is what we've done. We've, we've bit the regression. We can also get additional information by summarizing. So if you just hit summary MyLM, it'll give you this magical table about all the different aspects of the regression. So it'll tell you, it'll give you a lot of information. We're going to break down what all these different pieces of information mean. And when the course is done, you'll be able to look at this table and you will have a very good interpretation of every single number in the table. So if you see a number right now and you don't know what that number means, that's going to change very quickly. You're going to soon learn what that number means. So for example, residuals. Well, residuals, those are just the difference between the, the true value and the predicted value. And they give us a summary of all the residuals where we have a minimum, a first quartile, a median, a third quartile, and a maximum. We should be able to know what all those mean. So those are already crossed off the board as something we know already. So we know those now. We, have, we know what these estimates are, at least we have a high level view of them. We have an estimate for the intercept. We have an estimate for the treatment variable. So it, remember that that treatment vector from this, these are the coefficients and you see here, this is the coefficient here. This is the estimate for the coefficient for treatment there. This is the exact same things, the exact same thing. So we have the, co we have the intercept 0 0.29. We have the intercept 0 0.29. They're exactly the same thing, just in a different format. So those are all the estimates of these coefficients. We also have a standard error, which we're going to talk about later on, but high level. The standard error is the estimate for the uncertainty around the point estimate. So you have the point estimate, then you have the uncertainty estimate. The standard error is an estimate for the uncertainty around this guy. But that's just high level. We're not really going to get into that too much. Then we have these other things that we're going to get into later. And we have the residual standard error. That's something we'll talk a little bit about later in this F statistic. We'll talk about all these things in turn. One thing that you might see is this notion of multiple R squared and adjusted R squared. The multiple R squared is given by the formula we briefly mentioned earlier, where we basically said what fraction of the variability in the outcome was um, explained by our prediction using the covariance. So it's like, how much of the outcome did you explain? And here that fraction is 0.21. That's pretty high. In a lot of social science data, that number can be hovering around zero, meaning our outcome is just really unpredictable. If it's zero, that means I don't have any predictive ability. Or versus if it's one, that means I predict it almost perfectly, or perfectly in that case. So that's the summary table. I can generate a matrix representation of that by this command. This might be useful if you're making a figure or a table in R, you might want to do this. So basically COF summary is different than COF MyLM. So it's just, these are just the nuances that you learn. It's not super important, the difference, but basically this, gen, it, this if you do COF summary, it takes that summary table and it, it turns it into a matrix. So this is not a matrix. If you do class this, it's going to give you a summary dot LM. So that's the class. It's this weird class that, you know, it's specialized. I want to get a matrix representation of all this. So I can do coef summary my LM. And this is just going to be a matrix. A matrix versus array. So that's what we have there. This, so I can, exp this is a named array. Um, you can extract elements from a named array by basically saying, by basically referring to the name. So in other words, if I have um, an array like my array, and I do like, you know, b1 equals 12, b2 equals 3, 43. If I do this, I can extract the v2 element by going v2. Not all arrays are named. There are some computer programming language that, languages that don't have named arrays. For example, JAX does not have named arrays, or at least the base, func base package doesn't. OK, so now this treatment variable, this is the slope. Um, and notice how, well, that's the slope. I'm gonna not, we'll talk about this a little bit more maybe next time. But let's talk about how we can obtain predictions. So we have this MyLM object. That's the fit regression model. And I have my new data, which is like this. And I can basically predict out. I can generate predictions from my DF. What I can generate predictions 
which basically are the expected value of, you know, this, this basically is generating, generates the expected value of y given x um, for, all val for all observations in this. So you might sometimes want to do a counterfactual where you're basically saying if this country all of a sudden were to become a lot more prosperous, what would be the change in the predicted probability of becoming more democratic? So you can make those extrapolations using that. Um, we can now use some linear algebra to obtain these exact same predictions manually by basically saying, well, let's take all these coefficients, let's get the coefficients, let's get the coefficients, and then let's get, um, let's get a matrix, let's get that data matrix, which we had. So this is that data matrix X. So we have X, and then we have um, the betas. Sometimes you'll see beta transpose, but basically we've taken all the coefficients and we've stacked them. We've taken all of the data and we've put them into rows. And we're, we're, we're going to do that thing we talked about where we take, we take this, we take this, we do element-wise multiplication, first element, first element, second element, second element. We add them all up. That gives us the new, the new um, vector or array or, you know, we, we get that, and then we um, then then that's what the predicted value is. So that's what we have here. We basically are going to add this one, and then we do that because this one is going to um, take the role of the intercept. So we're gonna we want to be able to multiply by the intercept and the treatment variable stacked on top of each other. We have the intercept, we have the treatment coefficient, and um, we want to be able to account for the intercept in this matrix multiplication manner. So when I when I C bind this one to this guy here, I'm basically taking the I'm taking this guy here with all the information on who's treated and who's not treated, and I'm I'm, I'm column binding it with one. So the new resulting object is all ones on the left on the you know on, in the first column, and then the treatment variable in the second column. And I did that so that I can incorporate the intercept here that I have in these coefficients. Um, so now I'm going to do matrix multiplication. In R, matrix multiplication is given by this percent sign, multiplication sign, percent sign. So you do this. Um, in some situations, there's going to be errors that come up. So if I did as dot data frame, as dot data dot frame or something like that, if I tried to do this, I would get a most horrible error. I would not be able to do this because matrix multiplication only works on you know matrix type objects so because even though this data frame looks to my mind this data frame looks exactly like that matrix up here that data frame looks exactly like this but there's a critical difference and that difference has to do with the types so you'll sometimes have people tripping up over this tripping up over the fact that this is a data frame object whereas this is a matrix object and matrix multiplication only works when you're working with matrices. When you're working with array with um, with data frames, it just doesn't work in R. Um, so that's just a word of warning. So this generated our predictions, and now we might ask, well, are these predictions that we generated manually are they the same as the ones that R is generating um, automatically? It's always good to double check your work. It's always good to have sanity checks since you know even papers in the field that are published in top venues can have mistakes and they can have errors in them. So it's important to do a lot of tests, to run tons of tests. Am I doing this right? Am I doing this right? Am I doing this right? Tons of tests so that you know that you are doing this right, since it's never good to have kind of an embarrassing retraction. Um, so now we've basically plotted the predicted values here versus that we generated manually. And we also have the predicted values that we got from R. And we use the we use the AB function, AB line function to plot a line with the zero slope and, or zero intercept and a one slope. This line, it's really um, you'll often see these lines in, in projects. Like even in the some of the papers that we've been working on, you'll see these lines. And this line basically says, if something lives on this line, that means there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the one thing and the other thing. That means the two are perfectly moving in tandem. So a value of 0.5 for manual you know, is here, and a value is 0.5 for predicted is there. So that means the two are exactly the same. Anything off of the line means there's a deviation from that perfectly one-to-one -one relationship. So I have plotted the prediction versus my manual version of that prediction, and I've gotten them both, and I plotted them against each other, 
and I've confirmed that they give me the exact same thing. So this is just a way of me confirming my understanding of what's happening by doing the manual calculation up here where I did some of the linear algebra together with the automatic calculation that's being generated by the R because I want to be able to say what's R doing behind the scenes. I just don't want to accept it as face value. I want to ask myself what's the reason why? What's the reason why? And that's why I wanted to generate it myself. And I did. And I got it, and they're exactly the same, which means I understand it better now. Any questions? Is there anything that people don't feel they're feeling good about? So just one thing that maybe you don't feel good about is this AB line function. Um, and I like to, when I'm writing code, it's, it's often good to vertically separate your things. You don't really want your code to span long horizontal slices. Um, you want it to be just readable so that you scroll down and you can read it as you're scrolling down. So I like to do things like this where I have everything lined up um, and it's all close to that as opposed to something like this. Like if you have something like this on line 110, it's just the eye has to read it like a book and my, my brain is not processing it as quickly. But if I do it like this where it's more vertically stacked, I can just sort of go through and I, I see that these are all a bunch of options and I can more quickly kind of read this code compared to reading this code. And it's definitely good to, in my view, make it so that I, I like to do it more vertically than horizontally because reading code horizontally is a lot harder and you don't, it's harder to see the structure in the code too. Since now I'm looking at it and I'm seeing the fact that I have this function and I have a bunch of options. If I were to have this code that was more horizontally arranged, my brain would have to do more work to process it. Like what exactly is happening here? That's my personal opinion. You might disagree. But that's just one word of, I guess, um, one word of my personal opinion. So this AB line basically is, remember, it's generating a, a slope of 1, B is 1, and an intercept of 0. So that's that 1 to 1 line that we're talking about. LTY, that stands for the type of line that I'm plotting. LTY could be 1. So here LTI is 1. That's just a straight, beautiful, smooth line. But I want to be able to, when I add that straight line, that implies to me a, a fit to the data. But I want to use that dotted line as like a, as a, more as like a baseline. So it, to emphasize that this line is not real data, I make it LTY equals 2, which gives it that nice dotted line feel. And then I change the color to gray. When the color is black, that's to me implying that there's data there. But this is just a, like a me plotting the baseline of what we, what we should expect, if that makes sense. So we've generated the plot and we confirm that the two are the same. And we basically now have used R to run regressions, but we could even use R to run not just univariate regressions like I've done here, but also to run multivariate regressions. So for example, I could have the same exact regression model, but I could add some bells and whistles to it by adding covariates. So for example, um, these are, Let's see, um, we could add in this merge variable and we could fit a new linear regression with that merge variable. And now when I summarize that object, we're going to see one new coefficient because I've added in one new variable to the model. Remember, we're modeling these conditional expectations and I've added in one new variable. And now it looks like this merge variable or match, match variable is it has a particular sign, it has a particular significance. We'll talk more about those as we go in the class. But now we've done not just a univariate regression, but a multivariate regression. For completeness' sake, I'll say that if you add a zero here, a zero in, into that regression formula, you're gonna drop the coefficient, the ba baseline intercept term. Dropping the intercept isn't usually gonna be something you wanna do, but in some cases, based on theory, the intercept should be zero. So we had this project a few years back where we knew based on theory the intercept was going to be zero. So we basically forced the model to remove the intercept. Adding that zero here removes the intercept. Um, it, and that's what you have there. And that removes the intercept. This usually is not something you want to do, but some cases theory dictates that you should do that. So that's what you have there. And we're summarizing this new multivariate regression function. And those are some thoughts about that. We have three minutes.
So that's, I think, an, maybe I should ask their questions. Like this sort of stuff, working with regression is something that we all need to do and we all need to do well. So maybe I should just make sure that we really understand this really well. Are there any questions? Another, just one word of additional thought. You can also access things like the coefficients by, by this notation. This is basically um, using, so this LM object, it, it operates a lot like list where you have um, basically positions in the list and each position holds something different. So the first position could be a matrix, the second position could be you know, an array, the third position could be something totally different. It's, it's, um, a list is a very useful kind of data, it's a very useful data type, and we have here this LM object, and we can access some of the important things that we've been accessing in a different way by, um, by subsetting the list elements on the basis of the name. So here's how I could get the coefficients, and here's how I could get the residuals, and you know, here's how I could get the fitted values, meaning the predicted values. So this is just another way of doing the same thing. One word of caution, if there's missing data in R, sometimes the predict function and sometimes the residuals function won't have the expected behavior that you would think. Because observations, it, the, the default is when I have a missing value, the default is to simply drop that observation from my model. So here, let's just do that for example. So here I had, um, I had, in terms of observations, you can think of these degrees as freedoms as sort of, pro it's, it's correlated with the number of observations. So here I had about you know, 10,000 observations, but if I went like this and I said treat um, one to 5,000, it gets an A. If I did this and it artificially introduced NAs and reran my model, now the number of observations that's being used is dropping by about half. So what R is doing whenever it sees an NA in any of the variables, it's just dropping. It's just saying, I don't, um, uh, you know, it, it wants to write a formula. The expected value of YI given XI equals you know, beta 0 plus X. 1 xi1 times beta 1 plus beta 2 times xi2. It wants to write something like that. And if any one of these is NA, it basically says, I looked and I tried to do this, but I saw an NA here. That NA could have been a million or it could have been negative a million. So I didn't know what to do. So I just dropped this whole entire observation from my modeling strategy. So this is another thing to keep in mind. And it can cause a lot of trouble. And uh, you'll get experience dealing with that in some of the problem sets that we'll have in the future. So unfortunately, we're out of time. But hopefully, this was useful. Hopefully, you're starting to get it. And we'll keep going through it. And next time, we'll start to talk a little bit more about theory. So we'll end it there.